Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast. Today is Monday, October 19th. Jeff Erickson here with Chris Liss. We're doing this uh, video cast as well if you want to check us out on YouTube. That should be up a little bit later today. Uh, Chris, uh, how was your fantasy football weekend for week six? It really depends on what happens tonight. It could be very good if things go my way, and it could be pretty bad if things go against me. So I don't know, and I'm not going to find out till tomorrow morning because, as you know, the uh, night games, I, I catch them on the rewind version, 40 minutes. So I'll be very interested. I have to take the dog out in the morning now these days, the puppy. So if I get up really early at like 7 before Sasha and Heather are up or they get up right like 7.30, I'll, I'll squeeze a game. And now there's two games, obviously. Uh, and then I uh, take the dog out. And uh, if I if I haven't seen both games, I can't check my phone. So I can't like look at my phone at all or anything because – Right. Uh, you know, I want, I want it to be a surprise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I like sometimes when I'm catching up on games, I had to go out. I'll put my phone upside down. I'll make sure that, you know, and if I like pause, like if, even if I pause red zone, so psychotic. I mean, I don't know. You need to do that. But well, a, a, everything is a risk, right? Email yeah. could be a risk. Uh, people texted me. I got a friend who's like a Chiefs fan. He, he lives in L.A., but he's from Kansas City. And uh, he or maybe he's from Wichita, actually. But uh he texted me the other – like I got up, first text I saw was his, and it said, so what do you think about Le'Veon Bell as a chief? And I'm like, ah, oh, god damn it, I have CEH. You know, but that was the first I heard of it because right. I checked my text. I hadn't checked Twitter or anything or wrote a wire or anything. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, Twitter is the worst. Now, it's funny. During the baseball playoffs, there is this long, weird delay. It's like 20 to th- 25 seconds sometimes, I think behind when the play happens. So sometimes I get these writers that are at the ballpark and they insist on tweeting play by play as fast as possible. And it's really stupid and annoying. And I have to, I have to mute them because like it just detract. I, a, I'm not going to get off Twitter. It's just, I'm, it's what I do. I talk about the games on Twitter. Or I'm looking for news, but then I don't want to be spoiled by it. It's so like, it ruins the enjoyment for me there. I hate that. Just, just unfollow those dudes. Don't mute them. Just, you know, unfollow permanently. Well, I want them for, I want to get the information. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I follow the beat writers. It's beat writers. I mean, it's just like, ah, you don't need to do play by play. And you can tell they're doing it as fast as possible too. It's just, they're, they're trying to beat the, uh, and someone actually tweeted at one of them. was like, you think you're great for doing that? And he actually had said like, you think you're great for having nine followers or something like that. It's like, really? That's what you're going to go with is follow. That was the only retort. Was that he didn't he couldn't say like well no I'm offering a service because if you're not watching on TV but it's like just you don't need that service because even if you're not watching on TV then you don't care about getting it in real time anyway just let your feed tell you what happened just, yeah, just don't beat, super nice. don't try to beat the the actual TV that's that's all I yeah. ask you know don't be yeah. that guy um, so anyways uh, a lot of stuff going on. Start off the top, a lot of injuries. Miles Sanders going to miss uh, the game, th- game Thursday against your Giants with a knee injury, as is Zach Ertz with an ankle, and Zertz is going to Ertz is going to miss. Call him Zertz. Uh, Ertz is going to miss three to four weeks with his ankle injury. Yep. Well, he was doing nothing anyway. Yeah. The Eagles. It's really incredible. The Eagles, like they've lost last year, they lost all of their receivers. I mean, like every single one. And this year they're like, all right, we're going to sign. We're going to get redundant. We're going to draft a fast guy in Jalen Rieger. We're going to sign another fast guy just in case if Marquise Goodwin. But don't worry. We've got Deshaun Jackson back too. Right. And Jeffrey's coming back at some point. And then uh, we also have obviously two tight ends, Goddard and Ertz. And we have Miles Sanders who's really good as a receiver also. And what happens, not only does two or three of their offensive linemen out for the year, two of them pro bowlers, but – they lose both tight ends for multiple weeks now, and then they lose. Then Marquise Goodwin opts out. Deshaun Jackson, of course, gets hurt. Jalen Rieger gets hurt. Jeffrey's still not back. I mean, it's completely – how do they do it, Jeff? And then Miles Sanders is hurt. I mean, well, they, nobody gets hurt more than the Eagles. Right, and I just watched the replay of this game. Uh, you know, I do my rewatches, and I wanted to make sure I saw that because, you know – Nine games going on in the early window, and I had volume exclusively on my uh, Bengals Colts because I'm a masochist. Uh, but I, I I always go back, and so like I rewatch New England Denver. Uh, I'm gonna, I mean, I got to watch your Giants still because that's a Thursday game, so I got to make sure I watch that uh, coming this week because that that's more infl- intentional infliction of uh, of pain to myself. 
Well, by the way, I'm reading this Philip K. Dick book called Valis, and I've never read a Philip K. Dick book before, and it's really good, and he talks about masochism, and he says it's not what people think. It's not that masochists enjoy pain. It's that they believe, they have a deep belief that pain is inevitable, that pain is going to happen to them, and then choosing to endure some of it now is a measure of control over that pain. So by inflicting it on yourself on purpose, you're basically – you know it's going to happen, but there's some comfort in exercising control over when it happens. So, you know, you're choosing to watch the Giants game, Jeff. You're choosing to watch the Bengals game. And instead of expecting, you know, the Bengals collapse, well, I mean, the Bengals collapse is similar, right? It's like you know it's going to happen. You don't know. It's, it's that just, you don't it's, have control it's performance over. performance art and how. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I'm choosing to do chances to win on Monday as opposed to any alternative of yeah. listener interaction. So there is that. By the way. That was just such a hilarious thread uh, with that dude who hates chances to win, which he's totally in the right. He's totally in the right, but he's a douche about it. He's being douchey about it. He's taking it too seriously, but he's in the right. But the whole exchange is funny, and some guy got in and was like, what's the point of that, man? CBS and Yahoo, they, they tell you your chances to win. I said, yeah, but this is for real. Yeah, These I are saw accurate. that. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. And it's like, this guy's like literally trying to tell us why chances to win is not a good segment. Every week. We obvi- Every oh, week. It's the same guy? Oh, I've, I've just not him. I'm saying there's always that one person that thinks like, oh, I've cracked the code. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just so funny. Like this guy's like telling us how bad it is and whatever. And I'm like, dude, you don't know the alternative of what we'd be having to do if we weren't doing that. You can't just say this is worse, this is terrible without knowing what we would have to do if that wasn't what we were doing. So right. I think anyway. it's a fun little segment. And yeah. uh, I, enjoy- I don't care. I just think it's funny. I, I yeah. don't even care anymore i just think it's funny that people take it really seriously and people hate it so much and you know and it's just it is what it is it's I, the polarization of it is good it is it is uh, so going back to the eagles which is what i was starting with it's amazing first play went sacked second play like a, a, a throw to sanders that lost my, uh yardage because they couldn't block Third play, John Hightower drops this perfect long throw from Wentz. I mean, it was perfect. Uh, and when Hightower just straight up dropped in. He also was drafted this year, too. They, they kept redundancy upon redundancy. They lost everybody. Uh, you know, Fulgham had a drop. Ertz had a drop. You know, they, they well, just Fulgham kept should have got a Hail Mary. Fulgham had a good game, but he if he got the Hail Mary, he had a monster game. It was in his hands. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, well, and the touchdown was thrown up for grabs, too, on fourth down. But it's funny, Humphrey kind of like made contact with Peters and kind of just slightly knocked Peters off. And that was enough for Fulgham to be like, appear like it was wide open, like it was undefended. Uh, but, you know, Wentz was balling out in this game. He made a yeah, lot no, of Wentz, good throws. Wentz is a beast. And he, and he runs, and he takes off, and he's, he's, he's like a decent scrambler. He's not, you know, Russell Wilson or Josh Allen, but he's decent. And he sticks his head in there. He's not sliding. I mean, I mean he sometimes does, but he's also sometimes like, busting through to get over the first down line he's it's amazing that he stayed healthy this year because of all those guys you know he's also injury prone right. and probably will get hurt before too long and of course there's no bdn to take over if he does but there is uh jalen hurts which would be kind of interesting it's funny though i, I did a uh, sporkle quiz on all the fastest quarterback 40 times and jalen hurts is not that fast he's like four six eight he's like as fast as like He's as fast as like Justin Herbert, or maybe he's a little faster than that. Maybe he's four mm-hmm. six three, but he's not like. I don't even think he's as fast as Russell Wilson. Like, even though he put up like such monster rushing tunnels in college. Yeah, he's just a good runner. You know, he, he, good runner, good athlete, and fast, but not like Lamar Jackson, Michael Vick. They're in like their own class. Kyler right. Murray's right there, although Kyler Murray doesn't have an official time. It's an unofficial rumor that he ran a four three four or something like that. Oh, because he didn't four, run it at the combine. He didn't run in the combine or the pro day, so nobody really. I, I try to look it up, but there's no official time for it. Gotcha, gotcha. That's interesting. Uh, so, but it was, you know, it's funny. They they ran. The weird thing is they they ran, went. They had four two point conversion attempts in this game. Uh, they didn't let Elliott kick an extra point. Uh, he missed a 52 yard field goal in this game. But on one of the extra two point conversions, the very first one, they ran that zone read with Hertz at the helm, and it got stuffed, like absolutely shut down. They run two other two-point conversions that were successful on passes. Then the very last attempt at the end of the game, it's 30-28. And they try to go with the zone read again, and but except this time it was with Wentz and Boston Scott, and they got blown up again. 
Like they ran the same play that didn't work earlier just to the other side. Yeah, but, right, if you run the play that works and it works and then you run the play that works again and they stop it, you're like, oh, well, they now we're going to defend that because it worked. Yeah. Whereas but, if you run the play that didn't work, they're going to be like, oh, they'll never try that again. I guess. It didn't work. I guess. You know, I mean, surprise. it's not just like naively like, well, this works, this doesn't. It's like surprise and deception is part of yeah. It's part of it, right? So you can't just say, well, why they do the one that didn't work? Well, it's you know, it's just like what we said. It's like, well, Steelers are so obviously going to beat the you know three point favorites of the Browns, like, and the Vikings are so obviously three and a half point. Favorite. Right, right, right. You know, it's like one of them worked, one of them didn't. It, it's it's hard to know which is gonna, how it's gonna go. You know. Right. Uh, yeah. On the Baltimore side of things, you know, they just look off on offense. I mean, Jackson got his rushing yards. The running game, though. I, I I still feel like that offensive line isn't clicking. They they tipped a bunch of his passes. Uh, the the Eagles did on defense. Maybe it's just because the Eagles defense is actually pretty good. Uh, but I I just looked like they are off. Mark Andrews got shut down. Uh, Marquise Brown got shut down pretty much. And they maybe that's because they were trying to take him away. Maybe that's the reaction I, I should have. That well, Eagles defense is good, but also, I mean, they were up like twenty four to six or something. So. It wasn't really – they weren't throwing a lot, and Lamar ran for 100 yards and a touchdown. So he – that detracts from everybody else in the offense, right? Like when you have – we see it with Kyler Murray all the time or with whoever. You run, you get all the points for the quarterback and kind of ruins it for everybody else. I mean, I don't know who the Ravens are yet. I, I think the Ravens are obviously a good team, but I could see them getting knocked out in the first round of the playoffs like last year and just like, yeah, they're good, but they have this flaw that, you know, if they can't, if you shut down the, the running game, they don't have that much. Or maybe they're an elite team and they'll knock off the Chiefs and they'll win the Super Bowl, but I'm not, I'm not really sure about them. Yeah, that, that's possible. You know, I felt like this week was a little bit stuck in the mud, a little bit fantasy-wise, maybe just offense in general. But then I looked at what was happening. Chiefs are playing on Monday night. No Pat Mahomes. No Josh Allen on Monday, until Monday. And you look at the late game. No Dallas until late game. No Kyler Murray until the late game. No Hopkins and all that. You know, no no Seattle this week. No Saints this week. No Chargers right. this week. No Raiders this week. You know, a lot of the providers of offense, be a good offense or bad defense or both, were all either out or not playing until Monday. So it's kind of like, no, I don't know if defense necessarily solved things or the refs changed or anything. This might be because of who was playing. Right. Crappy teams missing. Yeah. So many key offenses. I think that's more what it is, but the scores are really low. That'll change by the end of tonight. Yeah. The scores will be higher. Yeah. And this was a tough week for anybody that relied on Seattle. Like I, you and I, like I did with Wilson and Metcalf, you had, a, you have Camara on your best team, you know, I have Camara and Metcalf. Yeah. And yeah. Get, and, and, without Dak that, and Chubb tough. and Dak and Chubb. Yeah. Well, no longer Dak, but right. Did you get Dalton in that league? Uh, no, I got Minshew. Yeah, I did. I put Dalton on my bench, but I, I started Minshew, and now that I know what he did, it's not terrible, but I don't know, 23.55 points. That's about that's about what I'd expect from Dalton, actually. Yeah, I'm not really NFC. sure what to expect from Dalton, to be honest, because, I mean, he's got great skill position players, but they lost both their tackles, and he's not as mobile as Dak. He's not a statue, but he's not nearly as mobile. And I, I think at the very least, the pass rush is going to be worse and they won't be able to run as many zone. They won't be able to run zone reads like Dak did. It's funny. His Dak isn't even that fast. I, 40 times. He's kind of average, a little above average speed, but I think it's also because he's really big and strong. He's 26. He's only six, two, but he's two thirty eight. Mm-hmm. So he's kind of built like a tank. Six two two thirty eight is kind of like a linebacker. And so his four seven nine speed, I mean, also, I mean, 40 times, not everything. And just 40 times is run at the combines, not everything. But he's not as fast as like a bunch of guys that are, you wouldn't think were that fast. I think Derek Carr has a faster 40 time than Dak, for example. Really? I didn't know that. That's yeah, I think funny. so. And he's just, I guess he's used to go, doing things on the run. So that's the thing. It's like, sometimes they say it's not pure speed. It's like being able to do everything at top speed, like as a wide receiver, making your cut at top speed. I think decision-making, throwing on the run, making that cut in the hole at top speed is also important too. That, and I think it's not just 40. It's also what's your 10-yard speed for a quarterback? Yeah. What's your 20-yard speed, right? Like if you get up to speed really quick, but your top gear isn't that fast, that's fine. I mean, how many quarterbacks are going to have a 50-yard touchdown run? 
You just yeah. got to get accelerate out of the the contain and get to the the edge quickly and slide. I mean, it's, it's 15 yards is all you really need. Yeah, that's right. One of the bigger disappointment games uh, was the Pats just laying an egg against Denver. And make no mistake, Denver was the better team in this game. I, I did the rewatch on this one, uh, and Denver moved the ball. They're the ones that were taking shots downfield. They're the ones that connected a lot of 10 to 20 yard passes. The Pats were all dink and dunk and running the pile and having to do trick plays to move the ball. They, they right. you know, and only and even that was only late. You know, I, I maybe it's you know, in fairness, they. They had like one practice last week, maybe two. Uh, they, they weren't able to do everything, install everything, and they, they, you know, Cam was only back for a couple of days. Maybe that had a lot to it. But I look at this team; their offensive line isn't that good. I think they've got some injuries there too, and uh, some depth issues. I don't think the wide receivers are that good. I, there are a couple times when Cam was looking downfield and had to pull it down, either run or check off and things like that. I never heard Nikhil Harry's name like at all in this game, and they just rarely Edelman for that matter too. Yeah. It's cam getting COVID not practicing the team, not practicing cam obviously signed pretty late in the summer and they weren't able to do the full training camp anyway. And then they get the extra bye week and it's not ideal. He probably knew the reps more than say, you know, a Matt Ryan or somebody with Julio Jones and guys he knows like that Calvin Ridley, Julio, Julio Jones, who he knows exactly where they're going to be at all times. So not an ideal situation. Denver's defense is better than, you know, Seattle's or one of the bad defenses they played. I wouldn't read too much into it. The Patriots also are kind of a gadgety offense. They always have in the last five years. Yeah, that's they true. Been. Ever since Pete Gronk, they've just been like misdirection, like little quick tosses. Like it's, it's not like a real offense. It's weird. It's like, it's all about kind of just keeping the defense off balance I think there's two kinds of <clears throat> like teams or offenses or whatever in sports. It's like one of them is, oh, I'm going to trick you. You're not going to know what I'm going to do, and I'm going to get an advantage. And the other one is, no, you pretty much know what I'm going to do, but you can't stop it. And the Patriots are definitely the former. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and all you have to do is look at the Seattle game. I mean, for a while that quarterback draw was unstoppable, but hey, it got stopped on the most important play of the game. It got stopped on another play late in that game too. Uh it is stoppable. You have to dedicate a lot of resources to it. And, you know, the thing is, the if you're if you're doing that, then you should be exploited in another way. But it, in the short haul, you don't have to you didn't have time to adjust to that. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, just maybe and maybe this is just a, a bad game for them. But, you know, they didn't move the ball very readily. Denver did. They were playing without Melvin Gordon, who might be back next week. He was out without without step. Let me say that again, without step strep throat. But, you know, he may still have a uh, suspension looming at some other point. But Lindsey looked fine. You know, Drew Locke looked okay. He made a couple, although at the end of the game, you can't have that turnover at the end of the game. That like pick that. and give him plenty of time to win. Yeah, that was, that was really dumb. But uh, they scored on their first six drives. It just happened to be all field goals. Well, they, but they never got in the end zone. Yeah. See, that's why I took the pass in Survivor. I knew Denver wouldn't get in the end zone against them. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, just, I still think Cam is good. And I, I don't know why Harry just can't. He's just like running in slow motion. It's like he's big, physical. I've seen him make a couple plays, but there's just no real spring to that guy. You know, he's kind of like it's kind of like he's Gronk, a smaller Gronk without the you know all time great hands or something. You know, he's just not he doesn't. He's not fast. No, uh, he's he's got no he's got no like maybe maybe he's been playing banged up or something. It's weird though. Like you see Terry McLaurin play and the way he moves and AJ Brown, what a beast he is, and DK Metcalf, what a monster he is. And you take Harry over those guys. <laughs> Drafting is hard, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a good takeaway. I, I think it is because it's not like when they took Nikhil Harry, they're like oh, they really reached on that one. At least yeah, nobody's. I, yeah. I don't recall seeing that in the moment. Uh, but so, maybe nobody likes to second guess the Patriots because they're like, Ooh, I'm not going to criticize that pick. I don't want to look like an idiot. Yeah. Uh, like Sony Michelle over Nick Chubb, for instance. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think I might've seen a little in the moment criticism of that, but I don't know. Uh, they, they just look off and you know what? That was a survivor chance. If you faded Miami, that was one of the, t your options there. 
No, I, I use I, – I mean, I, I'm out, but I made them my top pick. I just thought off the bye against Drew Locke. You know, I mean, they didn't get in the end zone. Mm-hmm. I was like, Drew Locke is not going to be able to carve this team up. And I like Cam, but I probably should have thought that through in terms of Cam's new to the team. And he he himself had COVID. He could be a little sluggish, although he didn't look – you know, he ran well. I don't think that was an issue. But, you know, he's just not practicing, not um, – getting the reps in and, and it's fine to not get the reps in if you're, you know, if, if you know the system cold, but you know, he's still learning. Yeah. Well, I, I, I pivoted even away from that. Aha. Uh-huh. But guess what? I took Minnesota instead. And that uh, was even Minnesota. worse. You're not really regressing your lines back to the market lines very much. Like yeah, when you took no, Dallas at that time. It's like the, you know, I, I, that really helped me when Rufus was talking about that because, um, I used to be like, oh, I made this line eight and I made this line six and then the actual lines were reversed. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I guess my, I got to take the, you know, if I made it eight against the spread, I got to take it in the survivor. But, but like, you're like, yeah, but the Vegas odds and the survivor are not the same. You don't have to just slavishly adopt the Vegas odds, but I do think regressing it toward the market number is a good compromise. Yeah, you're probably right about that. And in fact, I tacitly acknowledge it by saying, what am I missing here? And then I just plowed right ahead anyhow, though. Right. I mean, <laughs> but in fairness, like, you know, the Colts were seven and a half point favorites and were pretty much dead to rights most of that game. And, you know, the, the every week there's like a big favorite or, you know, there's there's outright upsets on 14 point favorites. Remember, the Vikings were 17 point favorites over the Bills and the Bills beat them outright last year in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, if if you were like, well, you know, I, I think the you know somebody was like, oh, I think the Vikings should be you know 17 point favorites. I'm laying the wood, and they lose. Any one event doesn't prove that you were off or not off or missing something or not missing something. It's just, um, it's just that in the aggregate, the market is is pretty smart. So regressing your numbers back is probably, you know, is probably smarter than just going completely out on a limb. Right. Yeah, I think that's probably the right call on that one there. Uh, you know, the team everyone, you know, was on was Miami over the Jets. And it turns out everyone was right about that one. The Jets, oh, they're they're just, it's it's funny that, you know, we, you and I had a discussion on SiriusXM, like, should the Jets, like, fire gaze over the loudspeaker or, you know, burn them at the stake or whatever method you were to get rid of them? And you're like, well, there's a case for holding them out, holding on to them. It's funny you said that because right as our podcast was starting, I got an alert and I had to turn my phone over because... There was a Yahoo column saying making the case for keeping you know, Adam Gase, uh, you know, it was by Charles Robinson, and it had a, had to do with Trevor Lawrence. Tank for Trevor that he's just that good; it's worth it, all that sort of stuff. Right, but that's that's insane. Like he's saying the same thing I am as a joke, but he's being serious. He's saying right, Gaze is so bad that if you were to replace him, then the new coach, even though he knows he's probably not getting the job, is still going to want to show some competence for future, whether it's a head coaching job or a coordinator position, wants to show he's competent. And that and that dead cat bounce that we talked about that happens seems to happen every time a guy fires a coach. It's going to get the Jets an unwanted win, and then you know that's not what they you know then they lose out on that really valuable pick. But I was just saying as a joke because <laughs> because there's just there's you can just experiment with stupid stuff, and it can't really go wrong because there's nothing. It doesn't really matter what happens anymore. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I know, and I just thought it was funny that I got that the same, after, right after we had been talking about it. But he was serious, right? He was being serious. Yeah, I think he is. I haven't read the column yet because uh, I'd be not paying attention to you right now, and I know that's not going to go over very well. But, yes. uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, but the, the Jets, they're just horrible. Flacco, I mean, I don't know if you saw the highlight, or at least were, because there's only two games. You might have even been watching it. The 25-yard sack that he took. I yeah. saw that. Yeah. That was awesome. I had the Miami defense. Too bad you don't get like extra points for, for a yards. Yeah. Sack. Yeah. 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 It would definitely yeah, be worth it. That. But yeah, it, it was, it was really bad. They, I mean, they, they tried to do the Bengals thing, kick a field goal down 24, nothing in the fourth and miss the field goal. Oh, that was so good too. I needed the shutout. All that was good. And then they were driving at the very end and, and, got, and they couldn't make it on fourth down. They could have kicked the field goal from, from there, but they went, it was fourth and three. So they were like, we got to go for it. Right. Cause it was and inside they, uh, the 10. Yeah. Yeah. So that was great. It was perfect. Yeah. That was beautiful. The, Jet, uh, the Dolphins offensively were just, eh, I mean, they did try to sell out the stop. Gasicki, uh, 
and and and, and, and Preston Williams uh, and and even Parker uh, and they did to a large extent do that. Williams got the touchdown. Gaze was actually talking about that at the press conference. He's like, yeah, but look, they only did this, this, and this. First of all, you're the offensive line, not Greg Williams right. is the defensive coordinator. Right. Uh, two, who cares? You still got you still lost twenty four nothing in embarrassing you fashion. Out. Right. Well, it's funny because it's like, yeah, and partly why they didn't do much is because they didn't really need to try that hard when they were up three touchdowns in the whole second half. It wasn't a lot of urgency on their part. I mean, you can't be like, we only lost 24 to nothing. That was good. It's like, well, they probably could have put up 35 if they really were hurrying it up and everything. Right. Uh, That's right. Uh, And they, they punted away on fourth and short on like four occasions when they were already up 21, 24, nothing. Uh, And I was like, why are you punting? And I was like, oh, I looked at the score and I looked at the Jets. Okay. Okay. I understand why you're punting. That's fine. Yeah, just punt. Yeah. Why give them any sort of – why why not make them earn every inch with Joe Flacco? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, the same game going on at that time was the Battle of the Bays, and it was not a battle. Uh, and it was weird because it started off Green Bay 10 nothing. You're like – and they had gotten another stop. And then Rodgers threw the pick six, and the entire game changed. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what Putin has on Rogers, Jeff, but uh, it's uh, it's got to be it's got to be some dark stuff for to make him play like that. It was, it was a dossier like, somewhere. I don't so, know. Yeah, must have been. Yeah, um, he went to some hotel. It's like honestly, it was like someone turned on the switch in that guy, and he just became Josh Rosen. You know, like he got deer in the headlights. He just made some pick. I mean, Aaron Rodgers has thrown how many picks in the last thirty-two games? Uh, in the last two seasons before the, he hadn't thrown a pick this year, I don't think. Yeah, so it, something really. So, so sorry, not thirty-two, thirty-six games. How many picks has he thrown in two, two plus years, two and a half years almost? I'll, I'll say like nine, six. Wow! And he threw two on back-to-back drives. Like, what got into this guy all of a sudden? So on like, oh, the uh, so good. second one, it Devon looked Adams like kind of he kind of the Adams got beat to the ball a little bit. Like it went yeah. off Adams' hands a little bit, uh, and the, but. Dude, it's 36 games. He threw six interceptions. He threw right. two in back-to-back drives. And then just like missed a wide open Mercedes Lewis, I think it was. He had a delay of game penalty. He just was totally off his game. And they had Devontae Adams back, you know, which was weird too. Mm-hmm. And I guess receivers don't matter, Jeff. I think this proves receivers don't matter. But I, I think it but, proves draft picks, draft picks do matter perhaps after though. Maybe after. draft but, no, receivers don't matter whether it's Robert Tanya or Devontae Adams. It doesn't matter, Jeff. That proves it. Just like when uh, Mike Davis <laughs> subbed in for Christian McCaffrey, running backs didn't matter. You know, the, the, the Packers essentially threw away their first three picks. Everyone uh, you know talks about the Jordan Love pick, but Dylan they barely used. They used a little bit late. And even their third round pick, you know, third round's pretty important. You know, you still get a lot of good guys out of there. They used a tight end, uh, Josiah Degura, who uh, is out for the season and, did very, you know, he had one catch for 12 yards before he got hurt. You know, they, he, they weren't using him either. Yeah, you know what's annoying too is because they're so thin at receiver, Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Equinemius St. Brown occasionally get some targets. And those names are really a pain to spell and write. <laughs> and it's not worth it, right? Like you'll you'll learn TJ Hushmanzada if he's catching 90 passes. and you'll, you'll deal with learning it, memorizing right. it. But I don't want to take the mental effort to memorize how to spell Marquez Valdez Scantling or Equinemius St. Brown when you know this is not a lasting situation. So you still have to make the same amount of effort to learn the spelling and then type it all out every time. But it's for what payoff? None. Yeah. Like you, you can distinguish between Devonte Adams and Devonte Parker spelling wise because they're worth it. Right. You look and, and Devonte Adams, much as I say that he's a uh, average talent, uh, he's been around for six. Yeah, he's been around six years. Devonte Parker with fifth and starts has been around five years. Like they're not, they're not. It's not like something you made the effort for, and a year later, it's it's over. You know? Right. So good point. Glad you glad you nailed that for us there. Yeah. Uh, well, very important. It's more but, of only a fantasy pundit only situation, but yes. It's yeah. That that's right up there with your concussion theory in terms of levels of expertise that uh, are you're unrivaled with. I. I don't like that you're making light of that, Jeff, because I really I feel like I do have a really good grasp on the concussion thing, <laughs> and even even the great Stefania Bell uh, is a little bit stumped by the duration of unconsciousness uh, not being a factor. I, I feel like I've made my case for that pretty strongly. Oh, I make light of it, and then I'm going to adopt it. You know, that's you do. You know. That's right. 
Trust me, if you go into a coma for 10 years, it's a serious concussion. And I, I won't let anyone tell me otherwise. <laughs> uh, the S- Niners and Rams were concussion-inducing in and in of, of itself. But uh, it, it was actually, it was okay of a game. But Mostert getting hurt again was frustrating just because he was looking really good again. Uh, and there's a there's a qualitative difference between he and McKinnon. There's no doubt about that in my mind. McKinnon looks slow. McKinnon has got good time speed, but he just looks slow. Even uh, Jamichael Hasty uh, was rushing it a little bit better than uh, yeah than McKinnon. You know, he McKinnon just looks like he's a good pass catcher. They put him in there on third downs. I think he got more snaps than Hasty after Mostert went down. But it's like Hasty was normal speed. Mostert was super fast, and McKinnon looks like he's in slow motion. Yeah, and it's I thought it was pretty telling that Hasty was getting the work at the end of the game. Yeah. Um, it was also, well, it was, it was in reach. They were down eight at one point. They had a chance right. at one point before that pick at the, in, in the end zone. I mean, there was, they could have gotten back into it. So yeah, I guess it, it was, I still think McKinnon will be the main guy, but, uh, and we'll see how long most are out for. We're not, it's and not keep in mind, yet. Jeff Wilson was hurt too. So he wasn't getting used here. So don't want to be rash and suggesting to pick up hasty, but no, yeah, you don't want to uh, rush things. He's going to be uh, among the guys. I mean, we're looking at Boston Scott in some leagues, probably taken in half of them, but we're looking at Giovanni Bernard. We're looking at Hasty. I picked him up last week speculatively. It's so funny. Like, every time you got to go through the waiver wire, like, especially in those first come, first serve, like, Sunday, you're like, what am I doing with, like, Russell Gage on my team? I'm just going to pick up Gio Bernard. You know, Mixon was already banged up heading into the game. And then, like, I have Tony Pollard. I'm like, I can't cut Tony Pollard. I mean, Zeke seems indestructible, but you never know. Right. And, you know, Boston Scott was on some waiver wires and I was like, ah, he sucks. Like, it'll be a committee anyway. Like, it's not a, it's hard to get excited about Boston Scott or Gio Bernard, who probably won't get like a super heavy workload. But in PPR, if there's no mixing, I mean, people are going to bid 500 bucks, half their budget, whatever, on, on Bernard. Yeah. And meanwhile, it doesn't always work out, though, unfortunately. Meanwhile, you know, you were patting yourself on the back if you kept Alexander Madison all along. Whole matchup against Atlanta. Atlanta, who sucks against the run, just they suck. Period. But they got that dead cat, cat bounce uh, firing their coach. The game flow was, you know, it was twenty nothing before you could blink, and that just, t- you know, he got game flowed out of it. Although he's ten for twenty six or something, so he wasn't even good. And your concern about the passing game came to fruition. He was not involved in the passing game. Yeah, and and they were behind too. Yeah, yeah it's just with the the thing is like. That's the problem with, you know, so-called handcuffing players, you know, making sure you get the backup. You have to not only be sure that he's the guy. So Boston Scott, he'll probably start, but like, is he, what's, you know, is he going to get 53% of the snaps rather than 70 that Sanders would get uh, and touches? And then two, even if he gets the snaps like Madison did, at least early in the game, uh, what's he going to do with them? You know, is he going to be able to do 75, 80, you know, 80 percent or is he going to do 90, 95 percent of what the other guy does? And and because they're they're so less established, it's so easy for the team just to go away from them. So right. if, and none of the backs got targets. Mike Boone, uh, you know, vultured a goal line carry on, you know, on fourth down, no less, uh, which is super frustrating. He was in on third and goal and fourth and goal, uh, you know, which is, you know, if you've got Madison going and I had him going in some places. It's terrible. Uh, and then you know, Amir Abdullah was, you know, present at the game, but they didn't use him either. They just th- they didn't throw to the backs. Period. Yeah, and maybe Cousins needs some of that. You know, the easy completions and getting to a, a groove too. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I I just think that this year I'm, I might write about this in East Coast offense, but this year and maybe it was last year too. Maybe it's every year, and I'm just noticing now. But it really feels like after about ten or twelve guys. You just can't count on anyone. I mean, Mike Evans, you can't count on Mike Evans. DJ Chark, you can't count on him. I mean, these are players that were, oh, yeah, these are the set it and forget it, you know, rounds three through five receivers that you have to have. Right. Um, And so many of these guys are just, you know, really? Juju Smith-Schuster? I mean, you can can barely use that guy now. Uh, It's There's so many of these guys that you're like, oh, I'm set. I got Juju Smith-Schuster, and I got, uh, you know, a couple of these guys and it's like well they didn't they're even obj I mean, I, you know he was obj has been he had one great week and it was a fluky week because it wasn't based on like the normal functioning of the offense it was like right. jarvis landry and then a, an end around run so yeah you're right obj has been very flaky this year yeah 
That, you know, and it's so funny. Like, you know, the league hinges on that DK versus DJ choice. And, well, if you choose Metcalf, you win. If you chose DJ Chark, oh, and that connection that he had with Minshew. And they're going to be behind every game. It's going to be great. Uh, except it's not great. Mm. No, it's it's so, you know, there's so many of those guys have been bust. So yeah. um, there's like a bunch of guys that are reliable and then and guys go in and out of the circle of trust. But there's like 12 or 15 guys that are just deeply in the circle of trust. Right. You know, Kelsey, Kittle. Those are like the two, the only two times. Mark Andrews will get his. I think he'll be all right. But right. it's like Waller is good. He gets a lot of PPR. But like is he that get pass touchdowns? game, it's hard to get out of your mind, though, too. Yeah, right, and they shut him down completely. Yeah, it's nobody does well every game except last year's Michael Thomas and Christian McCaffrey. I mean, you don't, you can't expect that, but just like okay, every game this guy's getting fifteen plus carries and five or six targets as a running back every single game, uh, and it's not David Montgomery where those things aren't even worth anything. I mean, like it's got to be he gets the opportunity and it's a credible offense where good things can happen, and those receivers that get eight to ten targets a week. And then some of them will be in the end zone and there has to be some capacity to, uh, you know, get down the field a little bit. Or if you're Michael Thomas or Devontae Adams, just get such volume that it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And I'm just looking at your rankings right now. And yeah. It, uh, yeah. Like even like Josh Jacobs, who's been pretty good. He's got you five touchdowns, three in one week, With three of the first week. But uh, and he's got. 15 catches at least he's not a zero there but it's not what it's not like he's killing it he's having three averaging 3.6 yards per carry you're hoping that that game against the chiefs opens things up for him later on because that means that they're stacking less against him but probably not and and he's one of the reliable ones you know it's kind of wild i mean some of this is the nature of the beast with wide receivers like i look at amari cooper at 26 he can't beat the the top cover corner. So you get a Bradbury week, and he gets shut down. But he's still got 424 yards so far this season. So Yeah, I'm at 14. I mean, 26 maybe overall or something. But Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the overall. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, all these guys are pretty interchangeable. But, um, you know, there's, there's probably 18 receivers that I trust mm -hmm. every week. I mean, Marquise Brown, Odell Beckham, I think they're going to get theirs too. But... You know, guys like Mike Evans, what do you do with him? He's barely getting any targets. He, there are no air yards. It's just a little dink and dunk into the end zone. Tyler Boyd is good, but, you know, A.J. Green seems to be resurrected, and T. Higgins is involved. So yeah. he's now one of three guys, and he's not a big play guy. Um, you know, I, I should probably move Robbie Anderson. I don't know why he went down to 28. He should be more like 20. But, you know, look at these guys. Michael Gallup, Chris Godwin is very hit or miss with these guys. Godwin's been hurt. Well, so many receivers have been hurt. That's that's one of the stories of the season is the hamstring injuries among wide receivers, whether it's Godwin or Galladay or, uh, you know, Julio, for that matter, or Devontae yeah. Adams. A lot yeah, of hamstring injuries this yeah, year. Thomas. Yeah, Thomas with the ankle, but just you know, it, it's been kind of a carnage, and that's been part of the problem. Uh, I will say this. I think C.D. Lamb is to this year what D.K. Metcalf was to last year in that – yeah, I think he will probably come on strong. I think the physical attributes are there, and he's just going to be a guy you're going to want to target next year. Yeah, but I think C.D. Lamb is ahead of Metcalf because it took Metcalf a while to get going. Sure. And also, um, you know, the Seahawks weren't throwing that much. And also, but Metcalf is way more of a, a beast than C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb is he's 6'2", 200, and he's not that fast. Mm -hmm. He's just like a good receiver. You know, I think CeeDee Lamb is going to end up being in the 4-5 speed. The Michael Thomas, Keenan Allen, DeAndre yeah. Hopkins, Devonta, that lineage of receiver, like a really polished, skilled guy who is a good football player. Whereas like DK Metcalf, we're looking at Terrell Owens, Julio Jones, Calvin Johnson. He's in that vein. Right. And... So, uh, yeah, C.D. Lamb may be, you know, I mean, Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins, those are superstar receivers. But um, but the Terrell Owens and Calvin Johnson to me are, like, greatest of all time when they're healthy and right. at their peak. Where are you going to do with Chase Claypool next year? I mean, obviously it depends on the circumstances, but he's in that vein. He's in that Calvin Johnson, D.K. Metcalf vein. He's, he's, but he's even, like, I guess he's – a little bit bigger even 
he's he's heavier. He's like weighs like two forty or something, and he runs a four four two. He's kind of like Evan Ingram if because he was kind of a tight end also. Right. Evan Ingram's not a great football player. Chase Claypool looks like a football player with all the physical bulk and attributes. So. He very um, I, nearly scored three touchdowns yesterday. He scored one, and it happened to be on a rushing play. But twice he got tackled inside, like like the two yard line, and led to rushing touchdowns the next play. Uh, and you know, one of those he made, he caught the ball at the twenty, made a move, stretched out, but only his elbow on his opposite elbow like hit the ground at the one. You're know, like ah, and all that. But the fact is, he looks every bit the part. Every week he's made a chunk play. It's not like he he's gotten that wide volume of targets, but they're realizing he's their best receiver. Even when Deontay Johnson comes back, I mean, you can't not use Claypool like that. Well, you know, I mean, Juju and, and James Washington are fine, but Claypool is just a total physical monster. Yeah. And then Deontay Johnson seems like he's one of those Antonio Brown unguardable, change directions at full speed, 5'10", 185 guys that just uh, gets open every play. And to have two of those guys, you know, the two different types – Right. I mean, like if you have Calvin Johnson and Antonio Brown at their peak, and of course, that's like the upside for both these guys, not the so it's a high that's high. Uh, it's maybe the 90th percentile for both. But what are you going to do about that? You got two number ones. I mean, this is like the the archetypes that they fit. You know, at least I do all the receivers. So I always like put them in a in a sort of a, a comp box. But you get two of those guys. It's just it's like game over. For the for the defense, you still have Juju and James Washington, but um, it seems like those guys are kind of ordinary talents. Whereas I, and Deontay Johnson may be jumping the gun. It just whenever he's been healthy, he's looked really good. And that was even with bad quarterbacks last year. Yeah, uh, that's that's right. So I mean, they're just they could be really nasty. James Conner looks great, by the way, too. He's in my circle of trust. Yeah, he's not catching as many passes as you would like this year, and it's not a great development that Claypool's get these goal well, line sure, carries. Of course, they have too many good targets. Yeah, but yeah, he's getting fifteen, twenty carries every game. He catches some passes, and he's in a good offense on a good team. Yeah, yeah. But the one negative for them is the the game flow was such is pure dominance that he didn't play the fourth quarter. They had a, a defensive touchdown in this one. You know that that's and that they hand the ball off to Claypool in the red zone at times. Uh, which is going to hurt him a little bit. Claypool's got two rushing touchdowns now this year. Yeah, as I just said, for Connor, it is not a good development. That yeah, the I was just talking about the passing team. game, but yeah, it's just like even run, handing the ball off though too. It's kind of crazy, but but I'm saying if you're the running, if you have the running back, and all of a sudden this giant receiver is getting rushing handoff touchdowns, yeah, that is not ideal. No, suboptimal. But uh, Pittsburgh looks the part. They go to Tennessee next week. That's going to be a fun game. Yeah, uh, I, I assume it'll be like two and a half, you know, or close to a pick em. Like, I think Pittsburgh's considered the better team, but I think it should be about three. We'll see when we'll we guess set the, the line. lines tomorrow. Yeah, we'll have tomorrow. To I, I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't looked, but right. it I, seems I, like that'll, that'll you know, there's, a, there's only three undefeated teams now that Green Bay lost, right? It's like Seattle, Tennessee, and Pittsburgh. That's it. Yeah, I, I've avoided uh, line spoilage so far. Usually I, I get like one game where some enterprising beat writer tweets it out. I'm like, ah. You're doing yeah, your no, job. I, saw, I muted. I muted somebody who tweeted it out. I'll unmute him after I do my thing. But he, I kind of know one. But you know the early line moves too. So I'm just going to try to. Yeah, but you got think. your framework now though too. So yeah. Uh, but I'm looking forward to that. Let's talk Tennessee Houston real quick before signing off because that was the best game and we've saved it to the yep. for last. Uh, that was the one like really really interesting game all day. You know we, we talked a lot about uh, on the XM show, but we haven't here. But Vrabel, I mean that. You know, he came on today and said he denied purposely taking that penalty. But I think, you know, taking that uh, twelve man in the uh, twelve man on the field penalty with three minutes left, three hundred one left, was huge. It stopped the clock, gained them, you know, gained them at least two plays. They they tied the game with four seconds left, so they don't get to get there. They would have had to hurry and do a lot of different things yep. differently uh, if they hadn't done that. Uh, just to let people know, what happened was it was second and one for the Texans. And Vrabel put 12 men on the field, got a penalty, making it first and 10. Well, now the Texans with three minutes left and the Titans had a couple of timeouts, could run some plays, but you have three plays, use your timeouts, get them to punt. And what would have happened on second and one is they just need one yard to not only run the clock, but get a new set of downs. And then you're going to cost either an extra timeout or 40 more seconds and really put them up against it. And worse yet, 
If it gets to third and one and they make that, it's game over. So right. uh, you almost, as the offense, want to decline the penalty and then kneel on it or like just have the quarterback sneak uh, you know, an inch short of the first down. I mean, that's what I would do. Just sneak, but just make it short. Just sneak and go. You know, It's one yard, go half a yard. Get close. Third and one, sneak it again. And then on fourth and one, go again. And the thing is, like, even if you don't make it, you still killed a lot of the clock anyway. Right. right? Like, and so, but they were like, oh, great. First down. Oh, what a, what a gift. They, they got the outsides. Well, now you just have those three downs and, um, and say, you know, and you can't use any more time. And it just shows because second and one is better than first and 10. In fact, I don't even think it's just a clock thing. I think if, if the other team has the ball, you know, at, at their own 40 yard line, second and one, just jump off sides, make it first and 10. Why give them a free shot to take a, a deep ball down the field? You want to end up at second and 10, not third and one. Or you, you want them to be second and 10, not third and one. You, it's almost like you should do that even when the clock isn't an issue. Right. There's so much at work in that one here. Uh, Rich Gannon was the, and he's more known for uh, from this game for going on an anti-analytics rant after the failed two-point conversion uh, later. But he also missed it on this one, too. He said, oh, that's an unforced error. You just can't do that. And you're moving the chains. And meanwhile, the clock has stopped. Uh, right. And the thing is, you know, it, it's pretty clear if Rabel did it on purpose. First of all, the guy he sent in, I was reading about this, the guy he sent in didn't play a single defensive snap last week, hadn't played a, has played 10 defensive snaps all year, uh, is only, or, you know, he's only in there to play like on garbage time. Uh, the, the Jonathan Joseph, one of the cover corners, like, what are you doing here? You could see the look in the huddle. And meanwhile, right, Vrabel's right. like, it's okay. It's okay. Guy. And then with like five seconds left, he's, he's frantically pretending to try to get the guy coming off field. He actually got screwed on this one because you can't have 12 guys in the huddle. You're not supposed to have that. The rest are supposed to notice it then and right there and call the penalty. But then he had to pretend to like wave a guy off and like, oh, I can't believe this happened and all that because you don't want he doesn't want he, tip off Houston that he's trying to kill the clock because then Houston will do what you suggest. Right, they'll decline the penalty and they'll just kneel. They'll, they'll think it, he doesn't want him to think about it. Right, they, right. he doesn't want and it, right and now he's bummed because as smart as everyone's saying he is now, it's not worth giving up the edge that he had. Right now that the cat's out of the bag, you know, you, you know Jeff in in L.A. always park in the yellow uh, loading only after 6 p.m. or on Sundays. But I didn't tell anybody that until now. I don't live in L.A., so I don't care anymore. Because now the cat's out of the bag. My edge is just another parking spot, if people right. know. But like I always be like, oh, no one's parking right in front of the restaurant. Sweet. Oh, what time is it? 6.10. Perfect. You know? So, um, yeah. You, you know, it's not worth – the bragging about being smart is not worth the uh, losing the edge and probably has lost the edge now. Although right. I think a lot of coaches are too dumb to adjust. Right. Or, or, you know, that's not the way we play the game. I did think of you another way, though, too. Uh, there was uh, you know, there was another play, and I'm forgetting which, which game it was. Uh, but they a team tried to hurry up so they could get the – I think it might have been Colts-Bengals. Uh, I think it was the Colts. And they tried to hurry up to get a 12-man on the field penalty, but the left tackle didn't realize it and wasn't set in time. So instead, it was a false start. Uh, and I know you hated the whole like Peyton Manning. Isn't he so smart getting that, you know, that free five yards? Like, well, you got, you're trying to gain the system and you got gamed. I thought of you for that. Yeah, that is funny. Because it, it wasn't that he was trying to game it. Because I do think like in pro sports, you game to the edge of the law because it's just, it's part of the game. I mean, you right. have to do it. But it was the announcers basically the belating the guy. Yeah. Being like, oh, that's so brilliant. It's like, oh, a guy had his toe still on the field and he snapped the ball and got the fight. Like, come on, let's. Let's praise him for his actual football skills, not this like stupid cheap stuff. But I mean, I, you can't fault someone for taking every advantage. I mean, you got to do it. Yeah, and it was like third and in inches, and it became third and five and a five and a, and then they they failed after that too. And that, I think they might have even not even got walked away with points. It was like a very like everything blew up in your face because of that. So it was kind of funny. But uh, anyways, uh, in that game though, Henry Derek Henry went crazy, two hundred plus yards. Running backs do matter. Uh, it's funny. AJ Brown looked awesome in that one. Is he back in your circle of trust? He is. I mean, he's the problem with him is the target volume is never going to be crazy high. I mean, uh -huh. They scored 42 points overtime game and he got seven targets. He got two touchdowns. So it's fine. But I mean, you want to see him get 11, 12 targets in a game like that. And, you know, Corey Davis is still out. I think he, he's going to be uh, activated this week. They are. Humphreys, the Humphreys was back and, you know, 
Johnny Smith got hurt in this game. He still only got seven targets, but Ferkser was the leading receiver, and he looks like a good receiver. Mario Puig was on him earlier. And then Smith doesn't have a serious injury, so you're going to have Smith, Ferkser, Davis, uh, Humphreys, Khalif Raymond's made some plays. So it's just hard. You know, obviously, A.J. Brown is by far the best of those guys, but those other guys, Ferkser and Smith and Davis is even, you know, obviously a very early draft pick. They're all good, Mm -hmm. all good enough. And Humphreys is a good slot guy. So it just seems like, and Henry's obviously going to get more carries than any other back. So I don't know if there's, he's going to be extremely efficient. He's going to get a lot of touchdowns. I'm not worried about him, but it'll be like, since he was hurt, he'll end up with like 74 catches for a thousand 20 yards and 10 touchdowns and 13 games. And that'll be, you know, a a really good year. So I guess he's in my circle of trust. It's just that, you're going to have some duds because right. nobody's good enough on four or five targets in like a, a lower scoring game to, to produce every week. Yeah, especially if they're playing with the lead all the time. But yeah, we'll see. Now, it's going to be interesting against Pittsburgh because it's strength versus strength. Pittsburgh does not allow you to run the ball. Uh, and Tennessee totally wants to pound the ball against them, you know. And they've, they, they've been able to establish that every game so far. But will they be able to do against a really stout Pittsburgh defensive line? I'm, I'm wondering. Henry had a quiet game, I think, the week before um, against uh, when they crushed Buffalo. I think Buffalo stopped him. I want to look at this yeah, game. It wasn't too quiet. Sure. Remember, there was the Stephon oh, Diggs around the world. Yeah, 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 but that's just an exciting play. He had he had two touchdowns, but he was 19 for 57, and he had uh, two targets and one catch for six yards. So he had 63 yards from scrimmage. Yeah. He did get the two touchdowns. He also had that big 50-yard <laughs> uh, reception in overtime yesterday, too, which is kind of crazy, but... Yeah, should be a fun show. I'm look, really looking forward to that game. So we'll see. It'll probably be a. I, I, I like the Titans a lot. Like I, I like watching them. I like Vrabel. I like Derrick Henry, mm-hmm. and uh, I just like the style of play. I think that we talked about this briefly, but like how the A's, you know, maybe that style of play doesn't do well in the playoffs. Maybe it's a small sample, but maybe it's also because when you optimize for regular season, beating the the average teams and the bad teams and getting a great record has that scale against the top pitching. Well, some teams, I think, and I don't have like great evidence of this, but the idea that the dink and dunk or the certain schemes and stuff are great against sort of undisciplined defenses, but you start to get the playoffs and on average, every defense is quite a bit better. Um, maybe they don't scale as well. And I don't know if this is true, but it just seems like the, the Titans total like dominance, you know, in cold weather in the playoffs Having a Derrick Henry and Tannehill, by the way, who can pass. It's not like they're, you know, the 2000 Ravens. I mean, they actually can throw the ball. It's true. Uh, might be a, a kind of advantage. And obviously different styles are going to make different games, and it depends who they're facing. But um, it just seems like the Titans, they went way farther than people thought last winter. And they may be, if Henry's healthy, they may be built for, uh, it just may be a, a January team. We'll see. I mean, yeah. I'm just kind of talking Yang right now because I don't have like some study on that, but it strikes me as they're going to be very different than a lot of these, uh, the way the other teams are built around the league. Well, you just look at last year. If you want da- uh, data, they were a January team last year. Uh, they, yeah. they, they did uh, pa- suit well to that. You know, I mean, and, you know, the Steelers too. I mean, I can't like them cause I'm a Bengals fan, but I respect the hell out of them. I mean, there's this continuity. Tomlin does some crazy things at times, but he's a good coach. They've had three coaches since 1969. That's crazy. Yeah. That's just that crazy. crazy. Noel right. Cower Tomlin. That's it. That's the list. Yeah, they, they haven't gone through those long periods of the wilderness like everybody else. Right. I'm jealous of shit. I mean, got to be. I mean, it just it's crazy. So, I don't know. But good good for them. Uh, but that, sh- that should be a fun game. Any other uh, closing thoughts? I know you're writing up East Coast offense. Anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I think I, – I'm not sure what I'm going to write about. I don't have like something that jumps out at me, but I think I'm going to talk about the circle of trust and how small it is mm-hmm. and how, you know, in draft day, the whole, oh, set it and forget it receivers and th- all these delusions, you know, all these like narratives we tell ourselves and then the season starts and you're like, well, it sucks that I lost Dak, but like, oh, I have Dak. That's why my teams are doing – like it's like three players, you know, Metcalf, Kamara, and Dak. Okay, well, of course I'm doing well in that yeah. league. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter if I – drafted this way or that way it's like i got three good players and really just go after the guys and i think these quarterbacks that have been we'll see how how sustainable it is but the russell wilson's and dak and see if i can replace them those guys have when you have all these sort of 
so much mediocrity and lack of trust and guys coming in and out of the circle of trust. The, the few guys you can trust, even if they're positions that are a little deeper, um, carry more weight than maybe, you know, you're really happy to have had Wilson in the fifth or sixth round because, you know, so many of those guys are just not worth it. And you're, you're putting in the Darius Slaytons you got in round seven or the CD lambs you got in round six or seven instead anyway. Right. So just getting a rock at any position uh, is is great in a you know in a season where there's a lot of uh, just a lot of turnover. Yeah, like and the guys you think that are like oh adequate fill-ins. Like I have, like just plug in Cam. I lost Dak, but just plug in Cam. And right, uh, not really. I mean, he got actually the Cam had a good fantasy day, least. and he got a reception for 16 yards. He actually had a decent fantasy day. Yeah, but he, he, yeah, it wasn't really all that great otherwise. But. Yeah. Anyways, all right, that's going to wrap it up. We got uh, Jake and Joe tomorrow. My uh, guest on Wednesday will be Howard Bender, old friend of the company. So I wish I had some fun with that. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening and watching us. And uh, good luck on Monday night. Take care.